Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our author talk. My name is Alana. I am an adult and seniors programmer with the Brantford Library. We're very happy to be welcome to be joined today by Jill Richardson. If you'd like to ask a question this evening, you can do so by using the Q&A option at the bottom of your, 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 your Zoom screen. This will allow you to ask your question at any time. Uh, there's also a chat option on uh, down there as well. Um, please only use um, that just for general comments. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A. If that's clear for everyone, we can go ahead and get started. Jail Richardson is the executive director of the Fold Fest Literary Festival, the books columnist for, on CBC Radio's Q, and an outspoken activist at activate on issues of diversity. She's earned an MFA in creative writing from the University of Guelph. And she's also the author of The Stone Thrower, A Daughter's Lesson, A Father's Life, which is a memoir based on her relationship with her father, who was a CFL quarterback, Chuck, Chuck Ailey. My apologies. The memoir received a CBC Book Award an Arts Acclaim Award, and a My People Award. Her essay Conception is part of Room Magazine's First Women of Color edition. Her debut novel, Gutter Child, is a dystopian story of courage and resilience. With the Brantford Public Library, we're happy to welcome Jill Richardson. Jill? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, we were talking before uh, this started that this is my last um, official book event of the year. Um, it's been a busy year. Uh, Got a Child came out in January. Um, so what I thought I would do for this evening is um, do a bit of an explanation about the book and then a reading of a section I've never read at an event. So if you've seen me at another event, I've never read this part. I'm really excited to to. Um, to hear this part or to, to read this part to you. And then um, I'll open it up to questions after that. So just to give you a bit of background for Gutter Child, I started writing it as soon as I finished the memoir about my father, um, The Stone Thrower. Um, and as I was working on The Stone Thrower, as I was re researching my dad's life, um, I started to come across these patterns and these um, these stories about the civil rights movement in the States in particular. And I started to pay attention to the world in a particular way. Um, and I really wanted to explore in this book, what happens when you grow up in a world that's designed for your failure. And the part I'm going to read for you in a minute is very much about one of those moments um, where Elamina realizes she's in a world that's designed for her failure. And I was really curious about what happens when you grow up in a system like that, when you realize it, what do you do about it? Um, and I started to uh, love the idea of creating a dystopia where I could talk about racism and colonization and the impacts that it's having. In particular, for me, I was looking at it from the perspective of the Black community, but also just sort of universal truths about colonialism and what it does and, and capitalism and how it sort of sets some people up for success and others up for failure and what kinds of choices people make when they grow up in a system where it's failed them from the time they were born. So those were the things I was exploring and curious about. Um, and uh, yeah, let me just read a, a short section for you. I'm going to read the prologue and then I'll read chapter, the beginning of chapter three. Um, and I think, I think uh, you'll be fine. <laughs> if you haven't read the book yet, you won't be totally lost. Um, chapter one and two are important, but I think the section I picked um, kind of reveals a little bit about the world that uh, will make it clear. So this is the prologue. When I drew pictures of mother and me, I used peach for her and chestnut for myself. Why is your skin named after something soft and sweet and mine is something hard and bitter? Because you are so much tougher, she said. I thought that was a very good answer and maybe that's true, but I am forced to be tough. It takes a particular kind of strength to exist in a world where you are not wanted. That doesn't feel like strength at all. Like giving up or giving in would be easier, smarter even. Maybe that is my chestnut, my toughness, the fact that I am still here. And then this is chapter three. 
So uh, at chapter three, Elamina's arrived at an academy called Livingstone Academy, and um, she's having her first meeting with the headmaster after spending a day on campus kind of meeting uh, the other students and uh, realizing that they all have two scars on their hands while she only has one. And so now she's having the meeting with the headmaster to kind of figure out what her role or education is going to look like. Mr. Greggers is standing in front of a large window that runs along one side of his office when I arrived the following morning, tired from a restless night. It's the kind of office I imagine important mainland officials having, the kind full of sunshine and light. And I pull my shoulders back in my new Livingstone uniform, just like mother would want. Stand tall and confident, Elamina. The floors, the shelves, and all of the furniture in Mr. Greggers office are a deep reddish brown and the air smells like stale cigars. A white General Covey statue sits on a pillar in the corner, while an antelope with sprawling antlers stares from the wall. A glossy, glossy black eyes, mouth slightly open like it was killed mid-cry as a prize. You're on time. I like that, Mr. Gregor says, turning slightly as the sun streaks through the glass. How was your tour? It was good, sir. I trust that Josephine was helpful, that she showed you just what a magnificent place we have here. She was very helpful, sir. He sits down at, at a desk covered in files, gesturing toward one of the chairs and inviting me to sit down. I have to say there was a part of me that was rather worried about your arrival, he says, picking up one folder from the small stack in front of him and reading the label before setting it aside. Worried, sir? I understand that this is your first time being with children who are like you, shall I say. But from what I can tell, you are handling it with an excellent measure of grace. I sit there, unsure how to respond, unsure how to feel about his words quite like you. I'm not a gutter child. They're not like me at all. Where is it you lived again? He says, searching the files, lifting and checking them one at a time before placing them off to the side. Cape Town, I say, on the coast. Ah, yes, of course, Cape Town. I traveled there once on a fishing excursion, he says. Not a bite to be had in the water, that is. But the food was absolutely divine. The town has a quaint feel despite its size, if I recall all those little shops. There was this delicious seafood resident, res, restaurant, Marty's, was it? Molly's Seafood Shack, I say. Uh, it's the most popular place in the whole city, but I've never been allowed to eat there. Yes, yes, just the most delicious salmon steak. I dare say it's the best I've ever had. He picks up a file and gives it a flick of approval, raising it up like he's found the one he wants. I see my name typed on the label on the left-hand side as he lays it down. Elamina Madeline Dubois. Elamina, my students usually come to me, um, usually come to me on their first day for a little chat, he says. And I notice how he pronounces his words so precisely. So the richness of his speech matches everything he wears and the decor of his office. We talk about the kind of work they'd be doing and the kind of work they would like to do here at the academy. But I know things have been different for you. So I have something else in mind, uh, if you're open to it. I nod and he smiles like this pleases him. Your debt is almost negligible, which is a fantastic way to start. It's one of the reasons, my debt. Your gutter debt, he says, as though this should be obvious. I look at him and he stares back tilting his head. Miss Dubois must have told you about your debt, he says, and I sit taller, wiggling awkwardly in the chair. Mr. Gregors leans forward, placing his elbows on the desk like he's confused or maybe even angry. You do know why you're here, don't you? I mean, certainly you know that. I bite down hard on my lip, wiggling my mouth side to side. Oh, for heaven's sake, he says. He lets out a long, slow exhale, pressing his fingers together and bringing them close to his mouth like he's not sure where to start. Let me ask you, Elamina, do you consider yourself a gutter child? I look down at my hands before I respond, trying to relieve all the tightness in my chest, trying to keep my voice steady and calm. Mother said I was only born a gutter child, that that's not who I am or how I should be treated or what I should be called, sir. Mr. Gregors raises his eyebrows and pauses for a moment, squishing his mouth to one side. Well, first of all, let me just say I'm truly sorry for your loss. I lost my mother when I was a teenager and it nearly ruined me, it certainly ruined my father. It's a terrible thing to go through for any child. But regardless of what Ms. Dubois told you or what she wanted before she died, 
it's important for you to know that legally you are a gutter child. You are a ward of the nation. And there are rules and laws that dictate what that means for you, especially now that Miss Dubois has passed on. That scar still means something, Elamina, even if you have just one. When I was growing up, mother told me that my scar was just like a birthmark, special, unique. She said it didn't matter what others said to me about it, and it didn't matter how I got it. Now, my dear, is all that matters, she said. When I asked her more questions, she refused to answer. Not now, Elamina, she would say, like I was somehow being difficult. Eventually, she told me that my mother had given me up on the day I was born because she knew she couldn't take care of me. She wanted, to be, she wanted me to be a part of a special project that meant I could have everything I wanted in life, just like a mainlander. When I asked her why she couldn't tell me more, she told me it was because she wanted me to live unfettered, a word that sounded so beautiful and boundless, like a bird on the wind, a word that made me trust that she knew best until it was too late to know better. In the hospital, I thought of all the questions she had never answered, and I prayed for her to wake up, whispering all my questions in her ear as though it might bring her back. Where am I really from? What happened to my other family, the ones who look like me? Are they in the gutter? Is it true what they say that that's where I belong? But she never woke up. And when her brain shut off completely, when the beeps on the machine by her bed turned to one solid scream, I knew I had waited too long to ask. So that's all I'll read for today. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I would really love uh, questions. Uh, I love uh, to talk about the book, but I always wonder, um, you never know who's in the audience, especially when you're virtually, but even when you're in person, um, whether people have questions about um, writing and craft or questions about the book and uh, some of the choices that were made. Um, I think it's always important to know when you're reading a novel that everything is a decision. Every, um, the tense, the characters' names, um, what happens to the characters, um, how it's written, how the chapters are formed, those are all choices. So uh, if you're thinking, ah, I don't know how, or I'm curious how, uh, you know, ask questions. Great. Okay, everyone. So um, <laughs> if you have a question, you type it into the Q&A and um, I'll read it out for Jail. Uh, so you mentioned actually um, everything what went into the name Elamina? Mm. Yeah, um, it's funny. Elamina came to me early, the name. Um, it's like, I always say naming naming characters for me is like naming a child. You know, it's it's um, just, it feels right. You know that who the character is, you know what they're about and you try and find a name that kind of matches um, who they are. And uh, it was also a song that I had heard by a Ghanaian, Montreal Ghanaian author, um, musician um, called Elamina. And I just at the time thought, oh, it'd be so cool. I'll name her Elamina. And then I'll have like a video that like a book trailer and we'll play the song Elamina. And like, so that's sort of where it came from for me. Um, I really just, it, it has never wavered. Sometimes I called her Ellie, like that she had kind of a nickname Ellie, but I cut that out, but her name has always been Elamina. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, some people have asked, they thought it meant eliminate or illuminate. Like there's all these questions. Mm -hmm. And I like, I never, I never thought about that. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's just been a fun thing that people have, have found or thought about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Lee has a question here. Mm. How did you decide on the use of gutter as opposed to something else? Yeah. So uh, gutter child, also the title and the term came to me really early as well. Um, I was really thinking about, uh, my own experiences growing up, uh, in Canada, um, when I was around 14, which is around the uh, age Elamina starts in the book, I really didn't know if I wanted to be black. <clears throat> and part of that had to do with what I was seeing on TV and how blackness and black identity was being portrayed in the news and in the media in what I felt was a negative way. 
Um, not that I was embarrassed of being a part of the black community, but just that I was like, ah, I don't know, <laughs> you know? And then there was the other side of it was that I was, um, I grew up in, in church, I'm a person of faith. And so in church, you were always hearing about blackness as being evil and bad and sin and all these things and whiteness as being good. And so I, it wasn't so much that I didn't want to be black. It was that the term really, I really struggled with the word. I still if you look at the history of uh, the terms that have been used for black folks, um, it has often been done to portray this idea of like evil, bad, uh, negative. And so even though uh, I think the black community, we really see it as a positive, I'm proud to be part of the black community. I think it's really important for us to understand words and language and how those, how people uh, are, are asked to carry terms like black on their bodies, um, even though it doesn't accurately reflect what we look like. Um, and so I wanted the term gutter child because I wanted I wanted the mainlanders to give the gutter folks, the soci I wanted them to give soci people a term that was very overtly negative. And I wanted them to give them a place that was overtly less desirable and to call it the gutter because it was, you know, the, it was the most Southern point uh, on the mainland. And then the people from that community would be called gutter folks, even though they're actually soci people. And I wanted that that comparison between who they actually are and who they've been named. Um, and so there was an intentional like negativity that I wanted there. And then Soci was, um, was a term that I just made up um, like many of the terms in the book. Uh, but I, I think it has a very neutral, a positive. It's about a location. It's about a place. It's about a people. Um, it, it doesn't carry with it that same negative connotation and baggage that mainlanders really intended when they named the the space the gutter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we have a question from emily she says i'm currently at the beginning of a new manuscript and have decided to use first person po first person present pov yeah. what are some of the possible pitfalls of using first person especially in a present tense Oh my gosh, I love this question. First of all, I love the question. Secondly, I've probably done over 50, maybe more events and I've never gotten this question. So I'm very excited. Um, well, so the reason I chose first person present tense for gutter child was because I wanted the book to be, um, and, and it's funny because everything's tied, right? So I wanted Elamina to be a character that did not understand the gutter system. Uh, I was looking at navigating a world designed for your failure. And so I needed a character who would arrive in the story and not really understand the world and would be kind of putting the, her own story together as the book went on. And so first person present tense allows that sort of immediacy of like, she only knows what she knows and the reader only knows what she knows. And so through the narrative, uh, Elamina has to figure out the system and so does the reader. And so it was really, I had actually written it in a different tense at some point. I think it was like a past tense and it just, it just wasn't working. And so I went back to present tense. The danger with present tense and first person present tense is that you can only tell the story from what your main character is experiencing. You can only say what's happening in the place that they are. If something is happening, for example, on the Hill with David a letter has to come to Elamina <laughs> so that she can, you know, that those kinds of pieces of the story, you have to find creative ways of bringing in outside information. Um, so you might see something on the television or the character might read something in the paper, but you can't find out anything that the character isn't presently at. And so that can be limiting. Sometimes, um, people will do it where they'll kind of do multiple narrators and one will be present tense and one will be like a third person, um, um, either present tense or past tense. And that's to allow them to give a sense of things that are happening in other places. Um, but letters are a really common way, um, calls, like information coming in from other places, but that's the big thing. So you really have to have a narrative that's very much tied to your main character's experiences, their, their present unraveling experiences. Uh, because if you want to talk about what happened um, in another country at the same time, it just, it doesn't work. Even another city, even another house, right? You can't really do that unless someone informs the main character of that. 
what I would recommend though, is if you're, if you're struggling or if you're like, I don't know, is just have a book. I always say when you're writing a book, have a buddy book, have a book that, and, and maybe it's got a child, maybe it's another one, have a book that's written in the similar tense, uh, in a similar kind of way that you want to write. And whenever you're stuck, like, I don't know how to reveal this, go to that buddy book. How did they handle this? How did we find out about, you know, um, I just passed. When did we reveal that? Right. Like you can go into the book and you can look and see, I, I was doing that with hunger games. <laughs> that was my buddy book for gutter child. So there was a point in which I was trying to reveal, I was trying to figure out in the chapter that I actually read how to reveal the information about the gutter system, how soon it needed to come into the story. And so, um, in hunger games, I looked at it to see, you know, when do you learn about district 12 and what's happened there and all that sort of stuff. And so I went to look where that happens, which was about out, like 20 to 30 pages in, I think, if I recall, maybe 15, I can't remember. But I also looked how many pages it took. And so that was where I sort of determined, like, at one point, there was way too much backstory in the one chapter. So I was like, oh, so I had to shrink it down. So I used my buddy book to kind of give me a guide of like, how much room to play with. Uh, she says, um, uh, The Hunger Games was her buddy book as well. Yeah, the same person asking good. questions. Yes. So Carolyn asks, what is the importance of the color green? Mm. Well, the color green is my favorite. <laughs> um, uh, like, and has been my favorite. I feel like I just love it. There's every shade of it. I almost love every shade of it. Some shades don't look as good on me, but in general, I love the color green in all of its shades. Um, in terms of the cover, I'm guessing you're asking, you know, green on the cover. There was actually two covers. One had red on the cover and one had green. And um, I loved the green one. I loved the, the X. Um, I think that for me, I mean, personally, I love the color green as a sign of growth. Um, and uh, it's always had really positive connotations for me. And I think the book very much is about Elamita's growth. So like on a deeper level, that's what I see when I think about green, but um, really it just came down to, they presented two covers and I liked this one better. And then I got green glasses and now the game is over. It's green all day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Melissa asked, you said you have an MFA. Mm -hmm. Do you think the higher education helps with writing? If so, in what ways? Do you think it helps in general or is it important to be in a writing related discipline such as English? Yeah. So um, I studied theater in university and minored in English. And then I took like four years off and then went back to do my MFA, my master's of fine arts in creative writing. Um, I think that the thing for me is that writing, first of all, I didn't really know that I was going to be a writer when I went into my MFA, which may sound strange. I actually wanted to be a prof at college, which meant you needed a, a master's degree. And I thought, oh, I'll write this book about my dad and then I'll become a prof. Boom, boom. Two birds, one stone. Um, but it turned out I was actually supposed to be a writer. <laughs> no prof for me anymore. So um, that's that was my motivation for going into it. Uh, writing is a really, really lonely practice for me. Um, some people like that. Some people are a bit more introverted than I am. Um, I actually struggle when I have to write for like long stretches of time and only write because I miss humans. <laughs> um, and so what I would say about, um, about an MFA is that MFAs for me is about community. And it doesn't have to come through an MFA, but an MFA was the right community for me getting started. It means that whenever you're working on a project, there's people who are reading it and offering feedback and that you're also just surrounded by people who are reading and writing and talking about their reading and writing. Um, and that to me is the most important thing I learned from my MFA, that if I wanted to be a writer, I needed to surround myself with readers and writers. And I started the FOLD, uh, the Festival of Literary Diversity because I found or I felt like being around a literary festival and working on that would be more beneficial to my writing than being a prof, which it was. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you can create writing community in a lot of different ways. So some people have write really great writing groups. Um, some people do just go to a bunch of workshops and like at your library, you can do those kinds of things. Some people, I was a big festival circuit junkie, still am. I go to as many festivals as I plan, probably more. Um, 
And uh, I just like to be around writers and be like, I don't have, they don't have to read my work for them to help me with my work, if that makes sense. So I can go into a writing event and hear two other writers talk and go and know how to solve a problem in my manuscript. Or I can do what some of you have done already, which is the best thing. And just ask a specific question. I'm working on a manuscript, like what would you do about X? Um, and so MFAs can be expensive. And they're not the only way to build writing community, but they are a very structured, helpful way for those of you. I'm very A-type, very organized. So like sign me up for a class, sit me down, give me assignments. I will get it all done. Um, ask me to put it together on my own. And I'm not so great at that, but other people might find the reverse. So it was the right fit for me for where I was at in my writing. Um, but really it is about being in community and surrounding yourself with writers and not letting too much time go by before you sit amongst with listening to uh, writers. Hmm. Yeah, Melissa. Uh, so we have a question from Kathy. Hmm. You, you, so speak... Keep <laughs> you speak of mainland. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder if Elamina is a fish or why people who live offshore are looked down on? Is that intentional? Is this intentional? Yeah, it's funny. I, I wasn't thinking of it so much in that way. I was actually just thinking about, um, <laughs> to be honest, a lot of the names that mainlanders gave uh, were very simple and basic and geography. And I find, you know, you go to most towns, there's a main street, a King street, a queen street, a George street. Like it's not that brilliant. <laughs> it's not that interesting. So a lot of the mainland names were just designed to be more boring and uninteresting than the Soci names for things. Um, and so I didn't think of that, but I did think about the way in which mainland implies that everyone else is an outsider. And I think we can see in our world and in culture how there's a sense of like when you are the, and I don't like to use this word, but like the dominant culture, how everybody else gets othered, even as those who are othered become greater in number, that dominant culture still ends up being the main um, and so there is a way that the term mainlanders and the term gutter actually implies this sort of center of the universe and the off, <laughs> the off side. Um, and I wanted that to be intentional because the, the mainlanders built it that way. They intended it that way. They came to Sosi land and intentionally pushed them to the side. Um, and so I wanted the language and the terminology to, to bring those very thoughts of being outsiders and insiders, even though it's actually reversed, that the mainlanders are actually the outsiders. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Darlene asks, I want to know more about the Hill community. Will there be a follow-up book? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the Hill community is my favorite um, development of the book, because I think when you're writing a book, um, the gutter and the mainland were very clear to me from the beginning. I knew what they were and what they were about. And the hill added this really great dimension for me to talk about, um, what I saw when I was writing and I was thinking about the complexities in the black community, that it's not just about, um, suffering, right. There are also, um, um, black folks and folks through history who have, uh, had some versions of success and done well in life and all these sorts of things, but that that often creates this conflict and this disconnect between those who were, um, who have had more difficulty or who have faced more oppression and those who have been able to kind of um, build a life in some ways modeled after colonization themselves in order to kind of just stay in the game for lack of a better term. So um, the Hill allowed me some really great complexities with the characters. Um, so there are five main characters. Uh, well, Elamine is the main character, but there are four other significant characters, Josephine, Violet, David, and Rowan. And I wanted this place that they wanted to go to, this place that they saw as better. Um, because I think we often think about these sort of promised lands, these places where, you know, life is good and better. And that's what we're aimed to get to. Um, and then I wanted the complexity of like, is that the right pursuit? Is that the right approach? Is that the right way to see things? And there's a really great, I, one of my favorite storylines is the relationship between Josephine and Elamina and how they see the world so differently. And yet they are such good friends. Um, and I think that to me was something that the Hill allowed me to do is to create dimension in this story of, um, a system that's failed 
figure out, well, what does it look like for the people who have kind of navigated their way around the system? Um, and so, yes, I am also fascinated with the Hill and yes, there is a sequel. Um, I'm working on it right now. It's like uh-huh. right over here. <laughs> um, uh-huh. And for me, I I finished the book in 2020 and there was actually an epilogue at the end that had a a little hint of what happens for Elamina and a little hint about maybe the hill, I'll say, maybe. Um, And um, what what ended up happening in 2020 is with all the events, the Ahmaud Arbery murder and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and some events that were also going on in Canada, I just felt like the story, the epilogue was not right. It did not fit. It was like taking the book in a different direction and it wasn't responding to where I was at and where the world kind of felt like it was at. And so I took the epilogue out and I had it end where it ends uh, because I felt like we all needed to face some questions about (laughs) what our hopes are for the world, what our hopes are for Elamina at the end of the story and really examine where, what are the origins of that hope? I I actually had, I will say like a problematic hope for Elamina, a problematic plan for her. Um, and I wanted to not do that. <laughs> and then I, I wasn't really sure honestly what to do. And so I just, I just ended it where I ended it. And for me, I began the sequel, like the day I submitted the final manuscript, because I knew even if I couldn't get a book deal, I knew that my brain needed to work through some of the things even more. And so um, book two is really about um, can systems be torn down? That's the big question that I'm wrestling with right now as I look at the world and as I write this book is uh, can systems be torn down? And if so, how, what? Um, Thank you. Um, so we have an, like, a question from Kathy. Um, sorry, when one when you write a story, when one writes a story, should it always have a political underside? Mm. I don't think so. I don't think it has to have a political underside at all. I just think it has to. To me, books are important. So I read books and a lot of people, I read them for entertainment. I read, for me, I read books to learn about myself and about the world. And that can be through romance. That can be through thrillers. It can be through all different kinds of genres. I'm not, I actually, heavy literary fiction is probably one of my least favorite genres. It's a bit too thick and a little bit too Mm -hmm. like, eh. (laughs) you know like like a very long documentary sometimes it feels like even though it's fiction so um I don't think it always has to be political for me it will probably always be political like if you read my books there will probably always be some politics in it but I say for me I always start a book with a question so that the book isn't about teaching my politics it's not about saying you know this is good and this is bad and this is how things should be done my books begin with a question and um, oftentimes, I mean, in this case, I don't even know if I arrived at the answer by the end. I think I learned some things, but I always work from a place of question, which means that, you know, that's why those five characters exist because they all look at the story of what happens when you grow up in a world that designs your from, that's designed for your failure from different perspectives. You know, Josephine and David have come together in a particular way with a particular life experience. Alamina has come from a very different experience and Rowan and Violet have also had very different experiences. And so you see over the course of the book that there are lots of ways to navigate a system that's failing, uh, that's failing and that's failing you. Um, And I don't think there's an answer to (laughs) what you should do or how you should do it. I do think that at any point in the story, each of the characters is going to make you angry and each of the characters is probably going to make you proud or happy. There's sort of a mix in how they respond that sort of says, yes, go Violet. And yes, Elamina. And like, don't do that, you know? And I think that's life. That's life. I don't think anybody's navigating this world perfectly. And so I love, I love having questions. And then I love imperfect characters that are messy where one minute you love them and the next minute you're like, but don't just don't Mm -hmm. do that. I feel like I've won if I get there. Yeah, no, I I see what you mean. I've read (laughs) a lot of books where the character is like, you love them. And then it's like, oh my God, what are you doing? What are you doing? (laughs) What are you doing is, is what makes me keep reading. Like, what are you doing and why are you Mm -hmm. doing that? 
is, is a big reason why I keep reading. So yeah, I don't think they have to be political, uh, but I think the most interesting ones for me have always been right. And I think it's important to understand that politics plays out in very different ways. So I think of a book like, um, I read a book called uh, The Erotic Stories of Punjabi Widows. Uh, it's one of my <laughs> favorites because it's about these, these widows, these Punjabi widows whose husbands have died and they're writing, or they're supposed to be writing, um, learning English, and all they want to do is write erotica. And it, it, <laughs> it, you know, you have this storyline of this incredibly, like what grief looks like, what love looks like, what romance looks like from the perspective of these older women. And I just loved it. And there's some politics in there, but also hilarious and delightful. Mm hmm. So uh, Melissa says, this isn't a question, but I can't miss this chance to thank you most sincerely for setting up Fold. Mm. It has been truly inspiring to me and the students at my school, especially the annual set, set of monthly reading challenges. I hope it continues to grow as it is such an important work and is so appreciated. Oh, that's so great. Thank you. Yeah, Fold is my, um, it's my baby. Um, <laughs> You know, I have a 12 year old and then I have a, a seven year old festival um, and it means a lot to me. It's it's been a slog uh, every year is like there is a challenge to it um, in one way or another, physically, emotionally, financially. Um, so I really appreciate that shout out for it. And I, I encourage you all to come and go. And uh, the festival will be May 1st to the 8th this year. The first half is virtual. The second half is in person. Um, and so we're really excited. Uh, well, hopefully in person. Um, mm -hmm. I hope you guys can, can come. Mm -hmm. So Elma has, you sound like an inspiration to help people reflect, reflect on the challenges of diversity. Mm -hmm. Is this your only book or are you going to force us off Netflix with another <laughs> edition. And what advice would you, you have given to yourself now, thinking back on when you said you were considering, are you really Black? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I've written the memoir and then I had a picture book come out in between the memoir and Gutter Child, um, Stone Thrower. So this is uh, Stone Thrower, the memoir. It's like light is there. That's oh, the yeah. memoir. Yeah. And then it became a picture book. Also here. Love that one for kids. Um, and so then Gutter Child came out in um, January. And then I have a children's book coming out this summer called Because You Are. Um, and I think what I would tell my 14 year old self then, I, I, well, I think this book is what I would have given my 14 year old self. Like I would just be like, read this um, because all I want and all I wanted for all I needed, I think was to be paying more attention to the world. I think I just lived a very selfish life. Um, and I watched my son who's 12 and I think it's partly age, right? It's part like, he just like, we were just at the, uh, um, a tournament and he just walked across the court with his friends while a whole other game was going on. And I was like, are you not aware that things are happening around you to walk around the court? Like, it's just, it baffles me. And I, I look at it though now, and I understand why I felt the way I did because I just was only taking in certain information and only from a certain lens. And one of the things, I guess, I guess one of the things I would say is I really trusted people that I shouldn't have trusted. I really believed TV. I really believed movies. I really believed um, <laughs> that what they sold about Canada being good and safe and better than our, our Southern neighbors and where my, my ancestors are from, that, that this was like, I, I believed all those lies that colonization builds in. And because I believed those lies, it meant I also looked at myself as somehow deficient and somehow less than because colonization says that, you know, a certain kind of beauty is the best. It says a certain kind of person is Canadian and others are not. And so I think I, I should have just looked at the world more critically and yeah, not trusted everything I saw as true. And um, that's what I loved about writing the backstory for Elamina was just thinking through, you know, what are the things that she would have been told and how would that affect how she sees 
the rest of the students at Livingstone Academy? How would that affect the way she sees herself in the mirror? Um, all of those things were really fun to reimagine and play with knowing what I kind of experienced growing up that I had to learn that I'm very grateful to be in Canada, but there is also some extreme criticism that I have to really work, work, um, I really have to change uh, in in what I what I present to my son and what I share with others when I talk about Canada. It's like, you know, it is great. There are some great things, but there are a lot of things that we did as a country that are terrible and that we haven't quite owned up to fully yet, I think. So, um, yeah, nice and light. Keep it light. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Actually, we have a few more questions, but I actually have one for you. Um, when creating the context of Elena's world, yeah. you obviously pulled from your research into your father's childhood, mm-hmm. him having grown up in segregation. Mm-hmm. What are the connections did you draw from the real world that you put into this book? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I was thinking a lot about a couple of situations in world history. Um, certainly apartheid in South Africa was a big consideration. I was also thinking about the caste system in India. I was thinking about um, times in history, past and present, where people are, and, and it started with the civil rights movement in the States and segregation and Jim Crow laws in America. But I was also looking at other places where um, the original inhabitants were being um, isolated, were being mistreated, and where a certain group of people were just determined to be less than, and therefore less worthy, less uh, able to access things. Uh, one of the groups that really fascinated me uh, in the research for this book that, that were a critical part in starting the story was um, the delete people who are in India, the lowest caste or the untouchables. And they're so, uh, I remember going to an event and they brought like a clay jar and said, you know, if, if a delete person comes to, um, a restaurant and they drink from this cup, they would break the cup afterwards because the idea is that they are untouchables and no one should have to drink from a cup that they've drank from, which is ridiculous. But there's a whole economic system that relies on these, this whole group of people being labeled untouchables, being mistreated from the time that they're born. And the whole caste system operates that way. And I started to look at America as having a bit of a caste system as well, in terms of its treatment of Black folks. And that was really like, those things were the beginnings of um, developing the mainland and the concept of um, gutter people and what happens to the Sosi people in the story. Hmm. So Kathy says, what can you suggest to learn about pacing? Pacing. Pacing. Hmm. I'm obsessed with pacing. I'm actually going to, this is, you know, I, I said, pay attention to writers and, and this is how fold helps me so much. So I'm going to steal some things that I've actually heard other writers say that are really important. But what I will say um, first, my strategy for helping with pacing is I always work now. It took eight years to write Gutter Child, and this was my approach in the last four years, much better than the first four years, um, is to always work from beginning to end on a manuscript. So always kind of for every draft, I just go beginning to end. I never go back to the beginning um, until I'm done. And then I'll start. And every time I start a new draft, I'm only working on one thing. So inevitably, at least one draft is all about pacing. It's all about finding out, you know, if if you're bored in a section (laughs) and editing, the reader is also bored. That's my theory. And so I'll try and fix scenes that feel like, oh, we've spent three chapters kind of working through this scenario. Something else has got to happen. So that's my own way. Um, One of my favorite uh, ways to help with pacing um, was stolen from, mm, what's the author's name? Anyways, it'll come to me before I finish this, but he talked about, um, I'm looking over at my bookshelf to see if I can see his book, but he talked about um, Eric Winter, Winters, Evan Winter, Evan Winter. He talked about giving his chapters grades and scores. So after he finishes his manuscript or does a few rounds, he goes through and he reads it and he ranks them and he gives it like a, a, a number from one to 10. So this chapter is a six out of 10. This is a seven. This is an eight. And if the chapter is anything below an eight, 
he works on it until it's an eight. And the reason I think that can help with pacing is because usually when you give something a six or seven, it's because something's kind of like sitting and not, it's just not elevated. So if you can identify that in your own writing and just um, in the later, I I would say, don't worry about pacing until the very later stages of your draft when you feel like it's, it's good, but something's missing. Um, because there's so many things that you'll add into your drafts that if you focus on pacing too early, you'll just create a really messy story. So I would say, write the story that you think you should write beginning to end characters, plot, just work that in. And then at, at a certain point, focus on the pacing and really ask yourself what's missing from this chapter. What could be added to this chapter? Where does it slow down? This is also where beta readers, beta readers can be really helpful. So this is when you give it to somebody else. When you give it to somebody else and you say, can you read this and give me feedback? Oftentimes people don't know how to actually give feedback back. So what you can say is, here's my book. Can you flag moments where you're bored or moments where you thought like something, I I don't know, I kind of flipped through these pages. I was kind of lost. Just get them to flag the moments where they're lost or bored. And then you'll be able to see what maybe you can't see in your own work. Hmm. And then go to another workshop where you figure out, (laughs) fix it. (laughs) So we have a question from Lee. He says, other than the Hunger Games, what other, what other stories, music, et cetera, do you draw inspiration from? Mm. So the other book that I used as a buddy book was Sula by Toni Morrison. Um, and it's about a young woman who there's like a bottom and a hill. And it was actually the first time I can recall, certainly the first time I had read a dystopian book by a black author, but I think it might be the first time I'd ever read a dystopia because I remember reading it and thinking, oh, I know what she's talking about, even though she hasn't named the city or the place. And she's just referring to these things as the bottom and, and the hill and this and that. So um, Sula by Toni Morrison. Um, I think I love, I mean, I love TV. I love TV in a way that most readers are like, what, how do you watch so much TV? I don't know, but I love TV. (laughs) So I get a lot of inspiration. I actually would say, and this is like a secret I've never really shared in a book event, but I get a lot of inspiration from reality TV shows because Mm -hmm. I find reality TV shows really fascinating on two levels. You have these real people in bizarre circumstances And then you have producers who are actually shaping the story and the narrative. So for me, there's a really interesting like craft lesson about how to tell a story. And then there's also a really interesting personality. Like when I watch Survivor, I love to see like who gangs up and who, who, who ends up on the outsides, right? We talked about the hill versus like uh, mainland and gutter insiders and outsiders. I love seeing that insider outsider shape around. There's almost always like an older woman who was out put on the outside very easily. There's often racialized characters used to be very easily like, oh, he just seems so angry or he just seems so, he's just, he doesn't seem to get along with the team. You know, there's these, these very interesting um, relationships. Same with the bachelor, bachelorette, fascinating romantic and gang based mentalities that I find fascinating. And so I get to see characters, um, people and how they behave, but I also get to see how story is told. So I think that, and that influences how I write. I think I'm very obsessed with pace and plot because I know that that's what keeps people reading. It's what I like. Um, it's what I like about genre writing, like romance and thrillers is that there's such a keenness for pace and story in a way that literary fiction is often about art in like art for art's sake. And I'm not as, <laughs> I'm not as like into that all the time, just sometimes. It kind of sounds to me like when you mentioned like, um, reality TV, like I remember watching Game of Thrones and then, you know, you have all these people ganging up and, yeah. you know, it, it, yeah, I can see what you're saying there. Yeah. And I love the idea that there is both like, in a, in a show, like I was just watching, um, what's the like squid game? Is that what it's called? Squid. Yeah. <laughs> That's squid the one. Game. Like I just started watching that. So in something like squid game or 3%, there's, um, which that one's from South America. There's this dystopian storytelling craft. You get to see it all played out how the writer shaped the story. But the great thing about reality TV is there's a part of the story that's really unpredictable where the characters mm-hmm. actually write the story as well. And so you get to see this like characters that you would want to put in your story 
on Survivor, on Big Brother, on The Amazing Race, on these shows, um, you know, you get to see this like wild extra, like characters that are quite off, off. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, that's what you're writing, right? You're trying to create really interesting characters in your story. So um, reality TV can be helpful for that. Uh-huh. Some people I'm like, I didn't know someone like you existed until I watched Bachelor. So <laughs> it's fine. Mm-hmm. So we have any more questions, but one final question for you. Yeah. Um, how has the, uh, the pandemic affected your writing? Like overall, um, with so much going on, how has it affected your writing, um, reading? It was a mess. <laughs> the first year, <laughs> the first year was a mess, like a really bad mess. I, because it was also like, I couldn't separate the the events of 2020 from the first year of the pandemic either. Right. So there was this like racial tension mm. on top of being isolated. I wrote an essay for uh, an anthology coming out in the spring called good mom on paper. And for me, it was the biggest struggle was that every writing and reading are solo acts. I can't really, I can sometimes read to my son, but like my books and my writing, it's just me. And with the pandemic, everybody was home and it meant that every personal hour had to be negotiated. I had to wake up before everybody else woke up or I had to say, okay, are you all taken care of? Cause I'm going to go hide away for two hours. And even then someone would likely interrupt me. So it was just like every piece of writing and reading was a contract with my family to be like, leave me alone for this time. And that became really exhausting, right? I, my son goes to school when my husband goes to work, I have like six hours that I can decide what I do with them. I can work on fold. I can work on writing. I can mix it up. Um, but there I was just everything working out, writing, reading all negotiated. And it meant that every day just felt like I wasn't getting enough done. And Um, the balance was just really, really off. And I realized like how important my family was. I used to be able to drop my son off at my sisters and my mom and my brother anytime I wanted or have some other child come to the house and entertain my son. Um, And suddenly like I was, we were the only people that could play with my son. And it was just really hard for me um, in a very privileged way. It was not hard in any like real <laughs> tangible, like financial way. It was just really hard emotionally for me. And, um, and there was just, it felt like there was no relief. And then, and then the racial stuff on top of it was just felt like a lot, felt like mm-hmm. a lot most days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Jail. And, um, if there are no more questions, I guess we can wrap it up for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us today. I uh, was very appreciated and um, I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. Um, so we're going to say good night for now. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. Awesome. Thanks okay. for having me and uh, have a happy holidays to everybody who celebrates mm-hmm. and a happy, just quiet time, <laughs> hopefully at some point. Yes. <laughs>